Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and a good night. I am Patrick. This is Storytelling Imperfectly, and welcome to the channel. And if you're new to the channel, I am Patrick. I hope you like what you see. The story I got for you today is both tragic and mysterious. And it actually revolves around a very well-known football player. But regardless of who it's about, this one certainly leaves me questioning a lot of things. And I think it'll do the same to you. Stick around, it's story time, guys. And let's see if we can't figure out what happened to Cullen Fennery. Colin Fennery was an outstanding football player. He was a quarterback, and he was a massive guy, even big for his uh, position. Most quarterbacks aren't this big, and Cullen was a monstrous man. He was 6'3 and weighed 235 pounds. Um, high school, he dominated, and then in college, he, he excelled. He went from being a great football player a great quarterback, to an outstanding and exceptional quarterback and football player. So much so that in 2003, 2005, and 2006, Cullen led uh, his college, which was Grant State University, led them to three NCAA championships, Division II um, championships. That's incredible. Not only that, but Cullen was a, a very tough guy. Where most quarterbacks really dodge the hit, slide, do a lot of taking the ball to the ground or spiking the ball if it looks like they're going to get in trouble or being blitzed, Cullen actually relished the hit. And in fact, he hit back. And it was something that really concerned uh, uh, his family. It also concerned his coaches. His teammates loved him for it, though. They just thought that um, he was the man. And he was. And his, his future looked absolutely brilliant when it came to playing professional football, so much so that, in fact, he was drafted by the Baltimore Ravens. Now, when he played for the Ravens, he never made it off the practice squad, which is really strange to me. I don't know the politics or what was going on in the NFL, but if you got a guy playing for you that's won three uh NCAA championships, I don't know why you wouldn't start him at least a few times, but Cullen never really got that opportunity. At one point in time, he was even let go of, uh, by the released by the Baltimore Ravens, but then they brought him almost immediately back, and they put him on, his pra on their practice squad. Uh, shortly after that, he was actually traded over to the Denver Broncos, and again, not much became of it. Cullen never really saw field or play time, and it was something that kind of bothered him because the guy was competitive, and, and he loved playing football. Eventually, he moved on from the NFL, realizing that he wasn't going to get the play time that he wanted, most likely that his career was coming to an end. It, you know, he was still young at this point in time. He was in his 20s, and he actually went overseas. He went to Europe, and he played in the European Football League. Um, after doing that for a little while, um, he came back to the United States, and he started playing in the Arena Football League. And it was at this point in time that two things kind of happened for Cullen. One, he realized that he was never going to be a professional football player, that his career was fairly much, you know, pretty much over. But the other thing that happened, which was the highlight of his life, is that he met Jennifer. And Jennifer was the love of his life. And, of course, they ended up being married, uh, Cullen went on to get a job uh, in medical sales. I don't know if that was medical equipment or pharmaceuticals, but whatever it was, he did very well at it. And so his career was taking off. He got married to the love of his life. They ended up having two kids together. And at the age of 31, life was looking pretty good for Cullen. Um, it was at this point in time... Uh, in, on Memorial Day weekend back in 2013 that Jennifer's family decided to go on a camping trip, a weekend-long camping trip on Memorial Day weekend um, around Baldwin River in Michigan. And so 
Cullen and his family said, you know what? We are also going to go. And they rented a cabin fair, pretty adjacent to where Jennifer's family were, was camping. Colin also bought like a small fishing pontoon. It's a, I'll, I'll put a picture up for you guys. Um, it basically has two rafts on either side, a little place for you to sit. But Colin was super happy about it. And he spent basically the entire weekend fishing and having a great time. In fact, everybody um, that was there that weekend, Jennifer's family, Jennifer, the kids, uh, everybody had a wonderful time. It was on their last day of the weekend, right before they left, that Cullen told his wife, he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go fishing one last time. I want to take the old pontoon out. I want to go down the river some. I tell you what, I won't be gone long, maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and I'll call you, and you can pick me up down at the next boat dock. And she said, okay, no problem. Now, there was nothing abnormal about any of this. Cullen had not displayed any abnormal behavior, and everything seemed right as rain. However, 40 minutes passed, and Jennifer's phone rang, and it was Cullen. And when she picked up the phone and answered it, expecting Cullen to say, hey, I'm down here at this next, you know, dock, come pick me up. Instead, she was greeted by her husband, who was absolutely panicked. She noted that he sounded afraid. And for a man that is 6'3 and 235 pounds, who has been hit by massive linemen, and played professional football to sound scared, something was seriously wrong. And Jennifer knew this. But even more weird or more strange of the situation was what Cullen was saying. Because Cullen was telling her that he was being followed, that there were two men in the woods, he couldn't see them, but he could hear their voices, and that they had been following him for a while now, and that he was very scared. And that ultimately his plan was is to beach his boat and then take his clothes off. That's what he told her. And then he hung up the phone. Now Jennifer at this point in time is completely baffled. And she's a little scared, obviously, because her husband just called her and said, I'm being followed by two men and I'm going to beach my boat and take my clothes off, which makes zero sense. She kept trying to call him back immediately, but there was no answer. Like, it just kept ringing and going to voicemail. Uh, at this point in time, Jennifer got on the phone, you know, notified her parents who were there uh, about what was going on, and then she called her brother Matt, who was actually very close with Cullen. And so he called Cullen, and this time Cullen answered. Again, Matt got a very confusing message from Cullen. Cullen was saying that, he was still being followed by these two men, that he had left his boat behind, and that these two men were still following him in the woods. Matt tried to get Cullen to say where he was, but Matt said he didn't, or, or Cullen said he didn't know where he was, and that he was really scared. But ultimately, the last thing he said to Matt was, it's getting pretty rough out here, and then he hung up the phone. After that, there was zero contact with Cullen. Um, Matt called Jennifer back and said, hey, I got him on the phone, but this is what he said. And it was really confusing, obviously. And Jennifer now, completely terrified for her husband and not knowing what to do, con contacted 911 and told them, my husband's missing. This is who he is. This is where we're at on the Baldwin River. This was the last place that he was seen. Um, and they, were, they completely understood and said, well, we'll get somebody right on that. Um, they sent people out. Now... The police at this point in time, um, before searching for Cullen, you know, just randomly throwing it out there, uh, formulated a plan, which is generally something they do. Uh, police tend to be organized, if nothing else. And they contacted Cullen's cell phone provider. Now, all cell phone companies have the ability to do this, guys, but they can triangulate your position based off the last time your cell phone pinged and generally get a... Uh, a geographical location of where you may be in that area. And so that's what they did for the police. The weird thing about this is, is that when they started uh, looking at Cullen and where he could be, he was pinging in different spots in this time period. Now, it was over a couple of hours, but in a couple of hours, Cullen was moving miles, guys. He would be in one position, and then four miles away, he would be 
a ping, he would ping again, and then he would move again, and it would be another four to five miles, and then he would move again and four to five miles. Now, around the Baldwin River in Michigan, it's fairly rugged terrain. And so for this guy, even though he's a very athletic man, to be moving like he's moving, I find exceptionally odd. More importantly, though, when the police started looking at how he was moving, either Cullen had to cross a paved road, all right, or he was right near a paved road with almost every ping that the police uh, were notified about by the cell phone company. So why did Cullen cross a road and then continue into the woods is beyond me. The, the, the road is safety, guys. If you are lost in the woods, if you're being chased by somebody and you get to a paved road, you should probably stick to it because eventually either a car is going to come past or if you follow the road, you're going to get somewhere and it's safe, right? But Cullen didn't do this and it's really unknown why. So for the next two days, they searched for Cullen. They did find his pontoon boat. It was beached um, not too far away from where he said he was going to wanted to be picked up by the other dock. And one of the oars was missing, but they, they didn't have any. There was no clues there. It was just his beach pontoon and a missing oar, but no Cullen. Uh, unfortunately, a day later, they did find Cullen's body. It was only a mile away from his pontoon, which again means that this whole time that he had been moving around and the cell phone pinging, eventually he had backtracked and made it within a mile of where he had gotten out of his pontoon. If indeed it was him that put the pontoon on the, the, the beach of the river, on the shore of the river. So your guess is as good as mine, but the weird thing about Cullen's body when it was found was it was face down, fully dressed, and when they rolled him over, he had his cell phone clutched to his chest, and his, he was bleeding from his nose. But aside from that, there was n absolutely no damage to Cullen. Like, no gunshot wounds, no stab wounds. He hadn't been beaten up or hit with anything heavy. He was dead. So this really baffled the police as well. Of course, Jennifer and her family uh, were devastated by this. And eventually, the autopsy came back on Cullen, and the official cause of Cullen's death was pneumonia due to uh, uh, acidosis, which is he was swallowing his own vomit. He was breathing it in. So he was aspirating his own vomit into his lungs. Now, I don't know how that happens, guys. I don't know how a man that is 6'3", 235 pounds, catches pneumonia from inhaling his own vomit and dies out in the woods of Michigan. But that's what happened to Cullen Fennery. The, the odd thing about this, now I'm no medical doctor, so maybe somebody could tell me in the comment section how this happens. But I'm fairly certain that pneumonia takes a little bit to kick in. Also, what made Cullen so panicked that he would even aspirate his own vomit into his, his lungs? I mean, something obviously panicked him so much that he did vomit, that he was so scared and so worked up that he vomited and then breathed it back into his lungs, so much so that he developed pneumonia and died? I don't know. That sounds awfully fishy to me. Now, the autopsy also stated that this most likely happened because he had traumatic brain injury due to all the years of taking hits while playing football. And like I said earlier, Cullen was the type of guy that took hits. He didn't slide. In fact, he would even embrace it. It was something that he was known for. In fact, in one of the playoff games back in his college days, he broke his collarbone and didn't tell anybody and actually played a game with a broken collarbone and won the game in the playoffs, right? So this is the kind of guy Cullen was. Traumatic brain injury can certainly cause paranoia. It can also cause delusions, hallucinations, and uh, anxiety. I mean, fits, confusion. Um, lots of negative things can occur when people have uh, TBI or tra traumatic brain injury. And... This might be the reason why Cullen thought that people were chasing him. And, and to be honest, there is a, from a, a family member came forward after his autopsy came out 
and stated that Cullen had shown up at their house back two years prior in 2011. Now, remember, this happened in 2013, right? Well, in 2011, this family member of Cullen said that Cullen showed up at their house in a bit of a panic, saying that he was being followed by somebody. Now, he couldn't identify who was following, you know, following him or where they were at, but he was certain that they had. And he came to their house in a panic state. But here's the weird thing, guys. Not only was Cullen moving around the woods, apparently like a madman, covering miles back and forth across paved roads, near paved roads, near safety. Um, he did something that doesn't make any sense if this is due to TBI, to traumatic brain injury. See, when in 2011... If Cullen was experiencing symptoms of traumatic brain injury, such as paranoia, and thought somebody was following him, Cullen went to safety. So he was experiencing anxiety and paranoia if somebody was not following him. Maybe somebody was following Cullen. But even if they were or weren't, it's not the point. The point is, is that when Cullen thought somebody was following him, he went to safety. He went to a relative's house looking for safety. In this particular case, Cullen moved around the woods like Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Predator, running for his life, and then found face down while aspirating his own vomit to the point of pneumonia and died. I don't, I don't, I'm sorry, but I don't buy that. I mean, I get that that's the official autopsy report, but it just doesn't seem right to me. Another thing that bothers me about all of this is that he had a cell phone, never called for help. Doesn't make any sense. His cell phone was pinging, so obviously it was in use, it was on. And one of the other things that really bothers me about all of this, right, is the fact that Cullen, being the size man that he was, and, and being, I mean, I can only imagine playing in front of a stadium in the NFL. I imagine you have to have some pretty stout nerves because that would be a terrifying experience standing in front of 34,000 people screaming and watching you. Um, he had won division championships. This man was good under pressure. So what caused him to break this time? I don't know. And the fact is he didn't show any symptoms whatsoever over the course of this weekend with his family that Nobody noticed any odd behavior. So suddenly, 40 minutes before their family's due to leave uh, this, this camping trip and to go home, he tells his wife, I'm going to go fishing one last time, completely fine. And within 40 minutes of being gone, somewhere in there, he suddenly pops a spring. I don't know. But I tell you what I would know and like to know is what you think happened to Cullen. Leave me something in the comment section below. This one really bothers me, guys, because it just doesn't make any sense to me. Also, guys, if you haven't done it yet, subscribe. Keep coming back, hanging out with me. That's it for me today. Thank you so much for being here with me. Hit the bell, guys. No matter whether you're an old subscriber or a new subscriber, hit the bell. Get the notifications. That way you don't miss out on the next video I upload. And, and last but not least, guys, please, if you enjoyed this video, hit that thumbs up button for me. Turn it blue, guys. It would really mean a lot to me. It lets me know you're enjoying the content as well as lets YouTube know that you're enjoying the content. And they may actually help me out, promote a small channel, and that way we can grow. But regardless, guys, no matter what, again, a million thank yous for all the support. The channel is growing. I couldn't do it without each and every one of you making it possible. It means the world to me. But that's it for Patrick today. I am out of here, guys, and I will see you in the next video.